about that time. Are we... Uh, yes, I have turned this on. Sounds like I'm coming through. Are we set with the live stream? Good to go? Okay. Um, I will bring this slide up for anyone who is listening. If you can hear me and you're not in this room, uh, this is a website you can go to where you can ask me questions and I've been given to understand that someone in this room, room will relay the question to me and then I can answer it for you. Um, you could also do it if you are in the room. It's just unnecessary extra steps. Uh, when you could just shout the question at me. So, um, I will start um, by acknowledging that we are gathered here on the traditional ancestral and unceded land of the Musqueam people. If you're tuning in from somewhere else, it's probably not Musqueam land, but it probably is some other indigenous land, uh, which you may or may not be aware of whose it is. Um, and especially seeing as this piece that I've created that I'm going to talk to you about is connected to place and time, it is even more important than usual, I think, to a, pay attention to what land it is and, and whose land it is historically. So uh, what you have, most of you, thank you for coming early, what most of you have just heard is a sampling of what Deep Evening can do. Um, if, you, if it plays for longer, you'll hear a lot of different types of things. You may have noticed me coming up and fiddling with some things um, behind the scenes. It's meant to exist over a much longer span of time, and so I kind of tweaked a few things to get more variety within just a half an hour. It's also not quite running exactly the way I want it to yet, so um, that's a bit of the adjustments there. So I want to uh, start with a bit of kind of what the piece is from a large scale, get into some music theory to kind of bring everybody up to speed so that when I start actually looking at what it does, I can hopefully manage to do it in a way where I can bring everybody along regardless of whether you have any previous experience with music or not. But hopefully in a way that's also interesting and maybe a few new things to those of you who are uh, already familiar with some music theory. So I want to start with this slide. Um, Everything you see here is running in a program called Max MSP. The MSP stands for Max Signal Processing. Uh, and it's a visual coding language built on C that's optimized for audio that lots of computer music people that are doing live interactive electronics use. It makes it really easy to throw together quick demonstrations and also to build more complex things that um, would be perhaps prohibitively difficult to deal with at actual like low-level programming language. So the long-form title of this is Deep Evening, Algorithmic Ambient Music Performance System Connected to Time and Place and Built for Arbitrary Microtuning. And I will unpack that now bit by bit um, because many of those are words that mean specific things in a music context that they may or may not mean in other context. So this is an algorithmic performance system. It's not a piece that I wrote exactly. It's a software that improvises music in real time. And every time it does something, it'll be slightly different than the time before, according to certain parameters. Uh, an algorithm or procedural generation is just a way of saying there's a set of steps. Some of those steps involve the computer equivalent of rolling dice, and you pick what notes to play based on that. There's not machine learning or AI going on here. This is all things that I've particularly coded to say, these are the options I want, these are the likelihoods that I want. Partly because that's much more difficult to deal with and partly because there's something nice about having, yes, it's procedurally generated, but it's also handcrafted. 
uh, in a way, that I have some control over what it does and doesn't do. Ambient music is a genre, or maybe more accurately, a, a purpose. If you think of dance music that's meant to be danced to, or art music that's meant to be contemplated aesthetically, uh, ambient music is meant to create ambiance in a space. You can put it on while you're reading, or washing dishes, or gathered in a space, and it's ideally interesting enough that there's always something to listen to, but not so interesting that it would distract you if you were trying to do something else. Um, ambient music is kind of trying to hit that sweet spot of doing the same thing like in a space like this. There's a lot of visual interest. If you're not doing something else, there's colors and textures and patterns, but it doesn't distract you from what's going on if you want your focus to be somewhere else. Deep Evening is, unlike a lot of other procedural kinds of music, it is connected specifically to time and place. This is hard-coded with our uh, rough geographic coordinates here, and it tracks what time it is relative to local sunset. And as the day progresses into night, a variety of factors of the music and the visuals will change to kind of reflect that. Ideally, this plays over like six hours or so from around now through to definitely night. And a lot of these changes are very gradual. Um, so what you got is kind of just a, a little showcase of some of this. And Deep Evening is built to handle arbitrary microtuning, which you may have heard when the piano stopped sounding like how pianos are supposed to sound, which may have gone to your ear as, oh, that's out of tune, which is not a bad way of describing it. It's also not a great way of describing it. But yes, it's not broken. That was the effect I was going for. The thing that was broken was different. Um, so I will kind of start with backing up and looking at if we want a system that generates music, what does it need to do? I would encourage you at some point to think about what is a good definition of music. If you come up with one that actually works, do let me know because I've heard a few and none of them quite do it. But for this, we can have a working definition of I want sounds to come out that have pitches and I want to have control over the rhythms and the pitches. Control over rhythm is pretty easy. There's not, as you hear, there's not a lot of groove or, or meter that's happening. So if we say, we'll have a pulse going and all of the rhythms are connected to that in some way. We'll have, maybe this, these notes will be two units long or one and a half units long. And everything kind of lines up to the grid more or less, which is exactly what we're going for in this case, nothing terribly rigorous. Pitch is the complicated thing and pitch is the thing that I wanna take a little bit of time to uh, dig into hopefully in a way that will explain what's going on regardless of the amount of background that you have. Um, so I will switch over to this. This gives you an idea of exactly the kind of thing that Max is great for because you can create a few of these objects and connect them together, hide the things you don't want in presentation mode, and this whole thing took 20 minutes to put together that would have taken hours if I were trying to uh, deal with the whole thing. And what this lets me do is play some sine waves, which I will do. Let's say... So that is a sound. Uh, it's specifically a sine wave, which has one specific frequency. Uh, all of the sounds actually in the world have lots of different frequencies going on at the same time, which interact in interesting and complex ways. For this demonstration, I'm just going to deal with sine waves because they're easier to work with, and they give you an idea of some of what's going on. But just be aware that there's more aural complexity and which combinations of frequencies are happening at the same time is what makes a violin sound different from a cello, from a piano. That could be a whole talk on its own. But for now, we want to come up with some way of categorizing pitch that makes sense. So here's one note, and let's turn on another note. That's the same note. We can adjust the frequency upward, and as the frequency in hertz goes up, the pitch goes up. And something very interesting happens right here. This note and that note, well, the second note is higher, but it's also kind of the same note. This is an interval that we call an octave for historical reasons that don't have anything to do with any number eight being involved in this scenario. There are gonna be a lot of those. I will try to tag those, but 
music theory has a habit of naming things after the way they were used a thousand years ago and then not changing the names even though we don't use them that way at all. So we have this interval, and if you look at the frequencies, that's just a doubling. Every time that we double or half the frequency, we get another octave. So this 440 is a note that we call an A. We have heard A440, it's kind of the standard tuning pitch. There's another one down below, an octave below at half. It's kind of hard to hear on these speakers. Uh, if you're tuning in on a live stream, you may want to use headphones. Um, but basically, every time we double this, there's another A. So now what that means is, if we can find all the notes we want between one A and the next A, all of those notes have other octaves. And we don't have to worry about the entire range of pitch. We just need one octave worth, and then everything just duplicates out. Yes? 440 hertz. 440 hertz, yes. These are measuring hertz, which is how many times does the sine wave cycle per second. Yeah. Human hearing goes from about 20 hertz to about 20,000 hertz. Uh, and most of the musical range is in the 100 to a few thousands, because the high stuff is difficult to hear pitch. You get like mosquito tone from a CR, CRT television, which is not terribly musical, although you could use it if you wanted to. Um, so we want some other notes in between, because if all we have is A's, then that's not terribly useful. So I'm going to go back through that again and listen and see how many notes you hear in between this one A and this other A. Common answers to this question are 7, 5, and 12. But in fact, there's no reason to break it into one size unit or another. It's a spectrum. At a certain point, the difference between two pitches becomes small enough that the human ear can't really perceive it. But that would be around 120-ish notes per octave, which is way more than most people have any need for. So we'll need to come up with some way of dividing this up that makes sense. I propose we do it the same way that Pythagoras did, and we'll say, we've got the ratio of one to two. Maybe that's the beginning of a harmonic series. What happens if we listen to the ratio of two to three? So if here's 440, that would mean this note would need to be 660. That's nice. That's an interval that we call a perfect fifth, which again, doesn't have anything to do with the number five in this context, but that's the name of that interval. So now, okay, if we stack up octaves on one side and we stack up these perfect fifths on the other side, eventually we'll come around to a place where they match and then we'll have some useful way of dividing the notes. I, I see some eyebrows. There, there is an issue here, but let's figure it out the hard way. So we'll start with a really low frequency that you won't be able to hear simply because I don't want it to go up into dog whistle tones here. And this button is just going to multiply this pitch up an octave and this button is just going to multiply this pitch up a perfect fifth. So we'll bump this one up a few times. Not quite. Almost, but not quite. Uh, and it turns out if you double on one side and 1.5 on the other time on the other side, they won't ever line up because math, unfortunately. And this is the great tragedy of tuning because there's a perfect mathematical way to get tuning to work out just right and it doesn't quite work. You have this thing called a comma, which is the unfortunate discrepancy between the way we would like the fifths to work and the way they actually do. And the entire history of Western tuning is figuring out what to do with that comma to make it as invisible as possible or inaudible as possible. The early strategies are take the intervals that you want and then stick the comma in the intervals you use less and just let them sound bad, which is fine, but it means if you want to change to another key, you have to retune everything. The system that we've kind of settled on now, which you may have heard of called 12-tone equal temperament, is to take the comma and just spread it around everywhere equally, which is, in, to put it in another way, take the octave and evenly divide it into 12 steps that are all the same size. The advantage here is you can play in any key you want and it's all the same, but the disadvantage is that none of the intervals are exactly the way you want them to be. You may have heard somebody try to explain to you that pianos are deliberately tuned out of tune or something to that effect, or 12 tone equal temperament isn't really in tune. And if you've ever wondered, what do people mean by that? Well, today is your lucky day because I'm gonna talk your ear off about what they mean by that for just a short period of time. So just intonation is when we have those nice interval ratios. And I'm going to go back and forth 
between a couple of chords in just intonation and 12 to an equal temperament, which is the closest you could get on the piano. So here's something that we would call a major chord. Nice. On the piano, the closest you can get is this. Which isn't really that different. But take a look at the volume here. It's completely static. The, the pitches really lock into each other, especially with sine waves. If we change it to equal temperament, the volume is kind of wavering up and down. And that's a difference tone caused by the fact that we're almost but not quite locked in. And you can kind of hear there's a little shimmer in the sound. This is easier to hear with what we call a dominant seventh chord. Again, ignore the seven. It's not particularly relevant. You've probably heard this chord before at the beginning of every barbershop song ever. Now, here's the best that we can do on a piano. And back to back, that really sounds quite out of tune. That top note is really high. Locked back in. It just clicks. So that's giving you some idea of the amount out that the piano is. It's not awful, but it's also not great. So that's kind of where we're working from. Uh, we're going to use... 12-tone uh, equal temperament as kind of the basis, because that's what MIDI is built on, which is what I'm using here. Um, but question. And that's just because that's the way that the MIDI here is decided that you should be thinking out Yes, because it's, it's, you're taking an octave, and there's 12 different note names. If you count C, C-sharp, D, historically we use 12. And if you just divide them evenly throughout the octave, you get 12-tone equal temperament is what we have now. Actually, even as recently as 100 or 120 years ago, pianos were not all in that. There were a variety of different temperaments that were mostly tempered, but not quite equally tempered. There's a very interesting history of things that are close to, but not quite 12 to an equal temperament, which is, again, another whole um, historical uh, dive. Yeah. Uh, within the octave? Um, yeah, so that you're always in the sharp mode, also in the piano. On the piano? Or are you are asking if there is a way to, to do this? Yeah, because something is not in line, right? And this is what you explained right now. Yes. Uh, because it always means people who are building the piano uh, like this. Yeah. Yeah, there are a couple of ways you could do it. One would be to say this piano sounds great in C major and doesn't really work well in any other key, which is how instruments worked, a lot of instruments worked 1,000 or 1,500 years ago, is you pick what key it's in, and then you only worry about tuning up those notes, and they can all be locked in. The other option is to have so many different notes, like 72 notes per octave, that you can get anything that you happen to want, which is kind of clunky to work with, but definitely can be done. 12-tone um, equal temperament is kind of the sweet spot of good enough and also quite easy, and you can change to different keys, which is very useful. Um, so with this 12-tone equal temperament, as far back as the 1890s, people were saying, hang on, we have all this terminology that's really outdated and talking about fifths and octaves and things like I am now that aren't really connected to anything that's going on. We should have a better system of doing this. And one particular person by the name of Arnold Schoenberg said, we'll just number all the notes. For historical reasons, we'll call C0, and we'll just number them 1 to 11. And then we can do math on them. He didn't do math on them, but his students, like Boulez, did math on them. And you can, and you get interesting things like integral serialism, which is yet another whole tangent. But the point is, this way of calling pitch classes by numbers is what gets used by MIDI, which you've probably heard of. It's Musical Instrument Digital Interface which is a protocol for sending musical data among different computer units. It was created in the 70s and is still being used actively today, which gives you an idea of how well they built it in the first place. And with MIDI, you can have 128 different pitches from 0 to 127, because it's a 7-bit integer, for those of you for whom that matters. And considering there's only 88 notes on a piano, 128 is 
really all that you need, assuming you don't want to play around between the cracks like I'm getting into. The lucky thing is with max, I'm not using actual MIDI, so I can just send a decimal value if I want to, and it'll work just fine. So 60 is middle C, because we have MIDI note zero is pitch class zero, which we call C. All of the multiples of 12 are also C, and all of the multiples of 12 plus one are all C sharps, and so on. So if we have 60, that's a C, 61, C sharp. If I send this 60.5, then I get the note that's halfway in between. I could send it 60.01 and get the note that's just one one hundredth of a step above C. Um, and the reason for doing that is mostly just because, yeah, there's a lot of other types of sounds that we could have. And as long as it's equally easy to try stuff, why not branch out and give people different things to listen to to expand? The, the interesting thing about in tune or out of tune is that even though I'm talking about you know, just intonation and mathematically perfect ratios, everything is entirely culturally dependent. There are, for example, if I have these two notes and we say, those are in tune, they're the same. But if you go to Bali and you play those notes on a gamelan, if they're that, it's not right. It should be something more like this, because that shimmering is a part of the sound that the instrument is supposed to have. So even tuning two instruments to the same exact note is culturally and subjectively dependent. I bring that up just to point out that just intonation is not some type of perfect thing that would be better if we used. It sounds really nice sometimes, and it sounds really not nice other times. And like a lot of these other scales, there's just more colors in the palette to work from. Hopefully, I have covered enough bases in terms of pitch that I can explain what Deep Evening is doing in terms of choosing pitches without losing anybody. But if I've skipped any steps, um, please do put a hand up. So we have, at any given time, there's some scale. Let's go to a diatonic C scale and see, this is what we're talking about. If, if Arnold Schoenberg were going to write up a C major scale, this just means we want zeros, two, four, five, seven, nine, eleven, which is another way of saying C, D, E, F, G, A, B. Any octave they're in is fine. Those pitches are in. Anything else is not in. And each instrument has a certain highest and lowest note. And it just makes a list of, oh. Um, I knew that was broken. I just didn't know it was broken in that way. Uh, it makes a list. So in this case, between D4 and D6, which are just specific pitches on the piano, there are 15 different notes, and they're numbered from 0 up to 14. Most, or at least the bottom two of these modules, don't care about what the pitches are at all. We're just going to move up and down this list and trust that if all the instruments are in the same key, then all the notes are going to be in the same key, and it'll probably all work out just fine, which most of the time is actually works just fine, especially with diatonic and pentatonic scales. So the first thing I'm going to do is kind of walk through the left side here, which are the general controls. We've got, as we've seen, the lowest and highest note. We can generate the scale. This tempo type, again, um, quarters, which are one beat, and eighths, which are half a beat, more of this music theory nonsense. Uh, these double going up, and a dot adds 50% to the length of the note. So there's three eighths in a dotted quarter. Well, there's two eighths in a quarter. That it doesn't particularly matter in terms of understanding what's going on, but it basically just lets me say, do I want the notes to go by quickly or do I want them to go by slowly without changing the tempo? We also have density, which controls, is it going to keep spinning out music continuously or is it going to take breaks now and again? And at low density, it'll mostly do nothing and just interject a bit of something once in a while. And we have the sampler here, which I have in a separate window. This just takes a note in and plays music out. We have a number of different settings. We can choose pianos and synthesizers and all of these types of things. Uh, you can give it whatever pitch you want, and it'll take the closest sample and kind of bend it until it's exactly the right frequency, which is how it handles any arbitrary note that we happen to want to give it. So I will turn the volume up on this. The first one of these that I want to look at is the interval cell script, because it's pretty straightforward. And I'll just turn that on. And maybe quarters. 
And so what the interval cell script is going to do is it has inside of it, um, that is empty. It has inside of it a list of cells, each of which is just a certain set of intervals in a row. We don't care what the pitches are. We're just saying, start on a note, go to the note that's two steps up, go to the note that's one step down, go to the note that's four steps below that. Whatever the pitches happen to be works itself out later. And so we have basically like a shape, a motive, with rhythms and how far up and down we're going. And it's just choosing a cell, running that, then choosing another cell and running that one, and choosing another cell and running that one from a list of about six or seven. Because the scales that we're using for the most part are not symmetrical, if you start at a different point, the breakdown of where are the major and minor seconds, where are the major and minor thirds will be different. So the same interval cell as you move it around will have slightly different shadings, just in the same way that if you think of like the beginning of Beethoven 5, with that dun 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 dun. When it moves, sometimes it's a major third down, sometimes it's a minor third down, sometimes it's a fourth, just to kind of fit the key better. And so you have, even though there's only maybe six interval cells, there's each of those got seven different places in a scale, for example, it could be, that are each slightly different. And so you have something that's kind of taking a list of motives and playing around with them and improvising out without changing the material. It's exploring all the different possibilities you could get out of that. And we have a number of different options here. Uh, so we could choose this one. Same idea, the cells just have a lot of shorter notes. Or we could choose something here. These are all pulled straight out of Gregorian chant. Or other things based on Gregorian chant. And so by choosing which list of cells we want, we can kind of have different sets of musical content. The next one over here is the melody mutator. Similarly, we only care about index numbers of how many notes are in the scale. We're not looking at the specific pitch content. In this case, however, we take a certain melody and we just repeat that, but change it a little bit every time or most of the time. So if I pick something like this one, it should be pretty easy to hear. Hang on. So it was a three note cell, but already it's changed into something else. Right now it's pretty close to sunset, so the variability is quite high, which is why it's changing this much. If we were really early in the day or really late in the evening, it would do the same thing for quite a while before it starts to mutate. And when it does mutate, it's going to add a note in or remove a note out or change the pitch of one of the notes or swap two of the notes around. So if we have something short like this, we get kind of an ostinato that keeps repeating but shifting a little bit. If we choose something like this one, this one's basically just a rhythm. Already, we have a second note in here. And if we wait long enough, the rhythm will shift because we move a note somewhere or double a note, and now it's slightly longer or slightly shorter, and everything misaligns with the beat a little bit. And so a particular bit, a particular lick of the melody that you're hearing might be on the beat, and then the next time it's off the beat, and the next time it's off the beat in a different way. In pretty much the same way that jazz musicians will take something that's just not quite an even number of beats and repeat it so that you can hear all of the different rhythmic options of the same material, almost like looking at Necker's cube coming out of the page and then turning your head a little different and it goes into the page. We can also take something longer and have a full on melody And this one ends up being 10 or 15 seconds long before it repeats. And every time that it repeats, maybe a note will be in a different place. So you have the effect of looping the same piece of material, but like a human performer that's kind of playing with things, maybe this note will be in front of that note next time, or we'll add an extra rest in, or we'll take something out so that the content is roughly the same, but not exactly the same. 
these presets are basically um, choosing. So for expand, it's more likely to add notes in than to subtract them. So if you have a short one and you want it to get longer, and reduce works the other way around, you could take a longer one and end up with something much shorter. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. These are all. Each one of these is is another. This is a data type called a call for collection, and these are all just basically text files that say what should these things do, what's the likelihood of um, of this being. Most of these musical materials, or many of the musical materials, are borrowed from places, with the titles being perhaps cryptic hints to where they're borrowed from. Some of them are borrowed from myself, and others are not, which is about as far into that as I will go uh, without my lawyer present. Uh, don't worry about metric modulations. They don't work, but I have other things that make that happen. So this is, these are the two that do kind of melodic stuff, and they're the two that don't worry about the actual pitches. Because again, the only thing this is spitting out is just index numbers of which note number should we play. It doesn't matter what key we're in. These upper two are dealing with harmony, and so they do worry about what the specific pitches are. So the chord finder finds chords, surprisingly enough, and then plays them. So we can turn this one on like here. Um, so what this is doing is taking a list of specific chord shapes in the same basic uh, pitch class set notation like our scale is written in. So in that case, for example, a major chord is 047. And it just says, given our scale over here, let's find all of the instances of that chord that exist, and then all of the instances of the second chord that exist, and just make a big pile out of all of the allowable chords that only use notes that we have and then use those to build a repeating cell. So we have here a number of different settings for what type of chords they are. This one has chords that are only two notes. Which is arguably not a chord, but it uh, doesn't really matter. These are fourth chords, which are kind of floaty and rootless in a way. and. We put the chords together, in music in general, we put chords together using something called voice leading, which is how we describe how does one chord go to the next chord. Because historically, a chord has got a lot of notes, and if the notes are going from one place to the next in a way that makes sense, if you think of a choir in four parts, each one of those is a voice, so the alto is hopefully not leaping all over the place, but each voice is doing something that makes sense internally. Hence voice leading from one chord to the next. And the way that we do this is pretty easily with either bass motion or soprano motion. So with bass motion, we look at the lowest note of a chord, and we say, okay, the next chord needs to have a lowest note that's not more than two steps away in the scale. And that does a surprising amount to go from random chords to chords that really sound like they have some kind of a purpose. Uh, there is no logic at the moment for saying, I want a particular chord progression that like, harmonizes toward this key. It's just putting chords together that connect because they're close enough by pitch, which is actually something that a lot of composers nowadays do, is let's get rid of tonal function and all that stuff that I skipped over telling you about in terms of pitches, because it's really useful if you want to look at 18th century European music, but a lot, not a lot of people use that anymore. And we'll just have chords that sound good because they're close to each other, and it works. Um, the other option here is soprano motion. We're looking at the top note not moving too much, rather than the bottom note not moving too much. Or picking chords that always have at least one note in common, which is great, but it ends up with a lot of repeating the same chord multiple times in a row, just in the way that it's coded here. And we're going to create a cycle of some length. So if I set this to here and change this back to four, you'll hear a four beat cycle that we'll repeat. Now, it's already changed once because it's almost sunset, so the variability is really high. But at extreme ends, it'll repeat that same cycle for quite a while before it changes to the next thing, to the next thing. And by repeating a cycle of harmonies that's four beats or eight beats long, you get something that's similar to the way that harmony works in a lot of other types of music that we're all very familiar with. Um, you may have noticed, hey, if we have pitch class set things like 047, 
how are we going to find those if we've got a scale that has all kinds of decimal places and stuff? Because so far, I'm demoing everything in just equal tempered major and minor scales, but it can handle anything. And all it does is just round every note to the nearest integer and then find the chords and then unround them back. So when we say find a major chord, what we mean is find something that's close enough to a major chord that it's not more like something else, which means that it doesn't stop playing when we're changing between one tuning system or another, unlike the arpeggiator script, which usually does stop playing. But it doesn't crash anymore. So you know we take those. Um, the arpeggiator under the hood is almost identical. The only difference is instead of being a chord where all the notes happen at the same time, it's an ordered list that goes up and down sometimes with particular gestures. So we can turn this one on. And it'll repeat each one for a certain number of times and then change to another one. So again, there's a number of different settings. There's that one. Here's this one for classical music fans you may recognize. great irony here is that this is from the well-tempered clavier, which fits the theme perfectly, and I didn't realize it until afterward, actually. I will admit that. So there's a variety of options here. You've got one that subdivides into uh, arpeggios that are seven beats long, if you want to have something that's slightly more offset. But it does two of them in a row, so it comes to 14, which is, it, it ends up working out in the end. Um, here, if the tempo type is quarters, subdivisions just mean we play two notes evenly spaced per quarter. We could have this be three or five or something else, which doesn't work terribly well at the moment, but it eventually will. And we can say, how many beats long do we want each chord to be? And how many of those chords should be in a cycle before it repeats, which works the same way here. And the voice leading is basically the same, only in general, because we don't know what the lowest or highest note is because the shapes might be different. We just go from the last note of the previous one to the first note of the next one and say, oh, that's not more than this many steps. So that's basically what we have. And then by combining some things, let's say I'll put this on here. Actually, no, I'll put this on here and play a bit of something. scale are a bunch of other things that have kind of just been doing their own thing this whole time without me monitoring it. The timing here is perfect because this bottom piece is the Sun Watcher, which matches, uh, it's looking at what time is it relative to sunset. And because the mood is zero and the variability is very nearly 100, I can say it's within about five minutes of the actual moment of sunset at this, at this time. This mood goes from 100 in the day to negative 100 at night, and the variability is negative 100 at both ends, and up to 100 at sunset. And this affects kind of everything that's happening over here. Variability is how likely are we to change what we're doing, uh, change chord cycle, or mutate this melody. And the mood is affecting more things over on this side. So you may have noticed this tempo number is kind of going up and down. The tempo continuously fluctuates. It's slowing down at the moment very nicely. It'll fluctuate more when the variability is high, and it will tend toward faster tempos during the day, and then gradually to slower tempos at night, based on the mood value. The pitch bender is doing exactly the same thing, only it's just sort of bending the reference pitch. It's not changing the tuning system, it's just speeding, it's pitching everything up or down just a little bit. And this effect of subtly shifting pitch is something that I really like to do in a lot of my electronic music. It, even if it's subtle enough you don't directly hear it, it kind of has a warmth to it, like listening to a music on an audio cassette or on vinyl, where the actual movement of the thing affects the pitch level, and it's close to exactly the same, but there's always just a little kind of give and take that's not present typically with electronic music unless you code it back in. It may be that at these levels it's not actually something that's audible, but it feels to me like it adds an element of warmth. And it also, over time, the pitch level is going to be higher during the day and gradually get lower as we go into night. 
the key changer here, I have turned off the auto change while I was demoing things. But we click this button and it changes the key. Just like that. Changes the key at the next whole note, I should say, so that things roughly line up. And if we have this set to auto, it'll just change the key sometimes. The variability is really high, so the key is going to be changing a lot right now. But again, during the day, at night, the key changes won't be that much. I'll turn that back off for now because I want to get to the real, like, save the best for last piece, which is the scale shifter, which you heard going during the demo, but you may not have quite realized what was going on. And this is one of these solving a problem in the dumbest possible way and getting the most interesting result, which is, let's say we're in C major, and we want to go to G major. How would we do that? Well, C major has all of the white notes, and G major has an F sharp instead of an F. So what if we just do a linear interpolation and make all of the Fs a little bit sharper until we're finally there, over 15 seconds? we're into a new key. There's, there's no moment at which it happens. It's just kind of like all of a sudden you're already there, which is one of those, I coded this up just kind of on a whim and listened to it and I was like, this is really cool. And because we're just shifting between notes, we don't have to go from one diatonic scale to another diatonic scale. Let's say we want to go really interesting and we want to go to a quarter tone scale in the key of B flat. It'll just cheerily go along, bending all the notes. The resolution there is maybe not quite as satisfying for you as the first one, because we're in a scale now that has quarter tones, which doesn't quite sound like it's in tune to, to Western ears. But it's still this, you don't even have to change to a key that has the same number of notes. So here's a pentatonic scale, Balinese pentatonic scale. And we'll just sort of merrily go along and bend everything until it eventually lines up. I'm doing these over 15 seconds so you can hear more clearly what's going on. But there's no reason this couldn't take a minute or two minutes of just gradually moving from one place to the next. And that magical moment of it like arriving in this new key is, I don't know, I think it's really cool. And it's something I was not expecting to have happen as I was putting this together. And then it's kind of become the, the cornerstone of how this deals with microtuning. Because we could just be in subsets of equal temperament, major scales, pentatonic scales, minor scales. But because we're bending between them, we're getting everything in between too, in a way that kind of sets up yeah, this isn't quite the tuning that you're used to, but it's, it's eventually going to end up back somewhere that you're used to. And we have this almost like, if you know much in traditional music theory of it, like a tonic dominant dichotomy. Here's the point of rest. Here's the point of tension. Here's the point of rest. We can do the whole thing without worrying about harmony just by bending through an out of tune scale back into another in tune scale. And there's this movement through discomfort into something that like really locks in. So let me turn these off for now. So the remaining question is, how do all of these settings do what they do? Because I could sit here and DJ the whole thing, and there's no reason not to do that other than I wouldn't want to stand here for six hours. Um, so what's going on in here is we've got a whole bunch of pre-made scores, and here's one of them, that just tells it turn this setting on, turn this setting on, turn this setting off at various times. This is in a data format that this cue list object knows how to read and send messages to all of the various places. And by having a bunch of relatively short uh, score units that we move through in a random order, and each one doesn't necessarily turn everything off when it's done, so sometimes pieces overlap one onto the next, you end up kind of collaging together individual bits that you've handcrafted to say, oh, these sounds work pretty well together. Here's another set of ideas that work pretty well together. 
and you'd sort of move from one to the next to the next. Eventually, I want to have a system that's a bit more procedural than this at, at a lower level than big chunks that are like 10 minutes long, but dealing with individual lower level things. Although the issue you have there is it will do more different types of things, but more of them will not be the kind of things that you want to listen to for that long. So I'm still working out um, like having a big thumbs up, thumbs down button you can click on to be like, yeah, do more of that. But that's more complicated. Um, so there's that. The visuals that you saw at the beginning, which I won't bring up right now because the, getting it on the screen is a bit of a difficulty. It's a bunch of images, some of which I took myself, some of which I found online. There are some text-to-image AI generators where you type in sunset, and it gives you all kinds of interesting things, some of which even look like sunsets. And it just shifts between them. They're grouped in bins based on whether they look like daytime or sunset or nighttime. It just gradually shifts between them with a little sprinkle effect on top, uh, which gives you something to look at while you're listening, and it's also connected to the overall change from day into night. And I think... I've covered everything that I wanted to, in which case, are there any questions? Did I leave something out? Oh, thank you. Not big on protocol here. Yeah, Sam. So what's, what's like the, the nominology of, of this? What's it, what's it like to experience this and, and building it, you know, breaking down this ambient music into Yeah. That produces a song. Oh, that's a really good way of putting it. I like that. Thank you. Musical clock. The world's least precise musical clock. Well, no, it's, it's precise if you know what you're listening for. Right? If you're able to, to determine you know, the variability of the mood, and you understand that you know, variability hmm. is affected by, by yeah. the dimension of, of the sonic scale. Yeah. Oh, in the process of creating this. Um, yes, so the key, the key question, oh, and um, I think there's a microphone somewhere for the, for the next question. The key question there, sorry for those of you listening who may not have been able to hear that, is what is the experience like of putting this together and actually coding the thing? And, and in a way, kind of adding my own twist to this question is what are, what are the things that you figure out by going through that you hadn't thought of ahead of time? And I have to say this, it's, it's definitely been a process of Initially coming up with an idea, the interval cell script was the first one I had. It's based on a similar kind of thing of a much smaller scope that I did previously, where you're taking something that's just looking at numbers of steps, which means you don't have to worry about pitch, and it's kind of just cycling around. Um, but then as in getting into, well, if we want to have a melody, what types of things, how do we want to change it? And then adding a note in, well, where does that come from? Well, maybe it's easier if we just repeat a note and then move it to somewhere else. Or looking at a chord finder and saying, okay, there's chords, but they don't sound like they're connected. What's, what's the way that we can put these chords together? And sort of starting with things, and they sound kind of like what I want, but not exactly. And then thinking through what are the steps to make it sound more musical. And in most cases, the extra logic that I've added has been exactly the same kind of decision-making process that I would make if I were composing a piece. It's just figuring out how to break it into logical steps that, that work, which in a lot of cases is somewhat easier than you might imagine. The magic that goes on behind the scenes in a composer's brain is somewhat less mysterious and somewhat more logical than I think most people give it credit for. Um, but the other piece is it is so satisfying to have created something and then hear it do something that I didn't tell it to do that sounded really good. That's one of the reasons I go for these kinds of things is if I wrote a chord progression and it sounds nice, I know it sounds nice and it kind of feels like I, yeah, I'll appreciate it sounding nice, but it's like I don't want to appreciate it too much because I made it. But in a way, like 
I made the thing, and then the thing made another thing, and that thing is really, really cool. Yeah, Joseph. Yeah, kind of building off that, I was wondering if you could talk to... Oh, question. Yes, yeah, 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 microphone. Uh, I was going to say, um, kind of building off of that, like, <laughs> uh, can you comment on some of the differences and similarities um, maybe between... So the, the job of a composer in a very simple term, in a very simple mind like mine, would be telling other people what, uh, how to, to do a thing. And what's it like trying to figure out how to tell a computer to do a thing as opposed to telling a person to do a thing? And how does that influence kind of uh, your creative process and how much you giggle when you write these things? Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a good question. Um, the first piece is human performers don't like playing microtones because they're really hard to do and most instruments aren't good at doing them. The computer doesn't complain at all, which is why whenever I do electronic music I do microtonal stuff because I can't get away with it with an orchestra because the orchestra would just, they would, you know, they would do their best and then they would complain and it would, it would be a whole, a whole thing. Yeah, well they already are unionized. They would, they would, they would continue, they would, they would, they would, I don't know what they would do. They would complain, really. They would do their best, but they would complain. But the, the main thing here is, with human performers, as a composer, you, you can be kind of the tyrannical approach of, I know exactly what I want it to be, and I'm telling you exactly, precisely what to do in sort of like a 20th century German kind of way of doing things like Stockhausen would do. Um, or you can kind of say, here's an idea, but I'm not going to give you too much details because I want you to do your artistry to it. And a lot of my music for human performers is like that. It's like, here's some sections, put them, play them in whatever order you want. I'm not going to tell you what tempo or what dynamics make artistic decisions, which works really well with humans because they're good at making those kinds of artistic decisions. In fact, better than I am because it's kind of their job. Uh, a computer is not good at making artistic decisions. So you have to tell it what decisions to make. You just need to figure out how to give it a list of decisions that are all good and then a way of choosing between them so it doesn't do the same thing too many times in a row without giving it so much freedom that it does things that sound bad. I've got a question. Yeah. I've got two questions, actually. Okay. Okay, so the first one is a matter of input. So here you have is the input is time of day, essentially, right? That's yes. sort of modulating all, all the, the, yep. the system, essentially. So uh, with the question with inputs, you can really imagine having anything as an input as long as you can reduce that anything into something that's acceptable in, into this uh, system, right? Yeah. So you can imagine this creating music for a slideshow at a wedding or something based on the exact pictures or, you know, uh, uh, you know um, like if you even to put in this, your, your values from a personality test or something, you can get the music that best describes you or something. So I wonder, like, what's the possibilities with, with inputs with the system that you've made here that go beyond uh, time? Yeah, so with this setup as it is now, it's fairly limited. It could take input of, basically there's two parameters that are working here. And if you have anything that's kind of timed to change mood over time and variability over time, you could map it to having things get the most interesting at noon, you could map it to dawn, you could map it to like go over multiple days and do interesting stuff on Friday, for example, and then chill out for the rest of the week or whatever. Uh, but it is, it is kind of based on that. Although I would say the conception of linking it specifically to evening and sunset is really baked into everything else that happens in terms of what instrument sounds I chose and what types of melodies I put into it. The whole thing is thematically unified by this idea of starting in the afternoon and then calming down to something in the evening. Uh, you could build something using these principles, not necessarily from the ground up, but you could build something that mapped to other things. If you had a slideshow and you knew what they were going to be, you could set certain things to happen at different times, but you'd have to kind of start over with these ideas rather than using this system exactly. Thank you. And the second question, what was it? It was, um... oh yeah, so sometimes when you're playing around with some of this stuff and you have some of these presets that were like in the style of like Bach or whatever, yeah. um, I wonder like with the system like this, are you able to um, sort of take 
like the axioms that or the principles that define, like in a logical sense, define different genres or different e eras of music, and code those in, and, and like in a sort of using the minimal amount of like principles to generate something that roughly sounds like that era of music. Not using this system, but it can be done. Um, there's there was a Google Doodle a couple of years ago that would spit out Bach chorales. Uh, that's the kind of thing that would be a lot easier with actual machine learning, which is not something that I know how to do yet. Uh, might do at some point. Uh, but at this point, the logic is all basically preset from a certain number of lists. And the only thing that I'm choosing here is these particular arpeggios are pulled out of Bach. But the way they're used isn't necessarily the way Bach would use them. They're strung together according to this arpeggiator script logic. Theoretically, is that possible? Like from a mu like is music oh, yeah. theory at the point where it's like these principles define each. Like if you put these elements together, you get jazz. If you put these elements together, and those yeah. would be like mathematical elements. I mean, if you want jazz, actually, we can do something that's at least some chord because there are certain chords that are associated with jazz that don't happen in a lot of other places. So if we have Vel kind of sounds like jazz. Yeah. So yes, I would say the the best way to go about that probably would be to pretend that you don't know anything about music theory and just get MIDI files of like everything Chopin ever wrote and put it into a machine learning thing and say make stuff that sounds like this but isn't exactly this. Um, you could hard code with rules and come up with something that like created chord progressions that were correct in kind of a Baroque sense. Um, I'm not sure why you would want to do that, but you could. If that were, if that were your goal, yeah, you could, you could do that. Okay. Thank you. This was yeah. awesome. Thanks. Is there any questions here? So you chose a, a really great time of the day to give this <laughs> talk then because it which is well with the sunset. Um, yeah, so what do, you know, you, you say that this is kind of measured by, by space and place. You know, how, how did that come about, really? You know, how do you translate those kinds of emotions that you get? Or, or what I'm assuming, you know, the feelings and the ambient yeah. feelings that you're trying to uh, get that you associate with Green College and kind of this area and, and this time of day, how, how did that translate into mathematics? Yeah, good question. So the, I should say the kind of origins of this, of me doing electronic music that's connected this way goes back about a year and a half. I was doing a seminar that was a music department with the Belkin Gallery, and I created a piece for that uh, that's still online on the Belkin Gallery website called Moonsong which is connected to, it'll only play if the moon is up in the sky and it does different things depending on the phase of the moon and the time of day. Um, the under the hood is quite different in terms of how it puts music together, but that conception is the same. Uh, and part of the idea of that course was looking at decolonizing music and seeing what certain, what pieces that we kind of take for granted of music are connected to a very Eurocentric way of thinking about what music is or should be and how it should be presented. And it's easy to have a live performance that's outdoors at sunset, that's in a place at a time. But electronic music is just kind of, it exists in the ether net somewhere. It's not really in a place or at a time. And so then there's this idea of, well, what, what could you do to make electronic music that is connected somewhere? And so I started with this idea of Originally, I just had the mood value, and then I realized I kind of wanted two, and basically thought from, from the ground up of writing this, we're going to have mood that's high during the day and low at night, and we're going to have variability that's high at sunset and low at the other times. And as I was building all of this at any given time where I was thinking, I want there to be some variability in what it chooses to do, I would kind of ask myself, what would make sense for it to do during the day versus at night. So like, I want the tempo to shift around. It makes sense that it would be slower at night and faster in the day. I want the pitch to change around. It makes sense that it would kind of gradually settle over that time. 
Um, and in terms of just at each level, thinking about how would I make this music differently if I wanted it to be afternoon music versus evening music, and then just figuring out the best way to turn that into some variable that changes the odds of something happening. Definitely possible. I have certain long-term, somewhere between a dream and an aspiration of something that works kind of like that. But then, like, do I really want like an app that tracks people's location data? Uh, that's a whole thing. At the moment, it's really just hard-coded with with latitude and longitude to like one decimal place or something here. So if I played it somewhere else, I would just need to go in and change that. Um, but yeah, you could you could have music on your phone that paid attention. And if you told it, oh, in this place I want this to happen, or in this place I want this to happen, or in different rooms of your house, you go into this room and it plays this kind of thing, tell it that you have uh, an early morning on Thursday and it starts the music before your alarm goes off, so you're already starting to wake up, that kind of thing. There's no reason it couldn't happen, it's just that nobody's done it yet because it's complicated. Uh, an actual question, and then it's, I, I, I have an idea for one of your first machine learning projects that I'll talk about later. Okay. Uh, just, just two of us. Uh, um, no, it's uh, just a technical question about Max MSP. So yeah. these compile to executable files on different platforms. Are, is it, I, I, based on what you've said, I assume it's, you can compile it to something that runs on Android and iOS then? Is it, not, is it mobile compatible? I, I am honestly not sure. So at the moment, these patchers are running in Max, which is the actual application. It can be compiled. I know for sure it can be compiled for Mac and Windows. I assume it can be compiled for Linux. Or if it couldn't, you could probably run it with some type of a, of a wineskin or something. Um, I think you can get it to run on iOS and Android. I haven't looked into that. That but would it, be really cool. It should be possible. Um, at the moment, it's all, it's all just running in the Max app, um, which actually, by the way, I hadn't done this yet, but if you're curious about what this actually looks like if we open up one of these things, um, where's the arpeggiator script? So here's the module in presentation mode, and then here's all of the stuff that makes it tick inside. Um, so this is choosing which chord goes next. Um, this is making sure the quantization works as well as it does, um, dealing with density, and all of these are effectively, these are custom objects that are effectively functions that are connected to each other um, in a graphical way. And most of these are, um, a lot of these are objects that are pre-made, so it's easier than starting from scratch. And it's all built to handle audio really well, so like the whole sampler is built on a engine that was made, I forget whether it was Bob Pritchard or Keith Hamill in the music department. They're the two computer music guys. And one or the other of them, both of them together, built a toolkit of things to help people make Max patches that are available for free. And one of them is the sampler that runs under the hood inside of this um, tri-sampler, which is called a tri-sampler because it has three of a thing that doesn't matter anymore. But it was an interesting idea at the time. No questions? Well, if you want to take a look at all the scales I've got. <laughs> Anybody want to pick a scale they'd like to see what it sounds like? It'd be like the candy man. Give me that seven EDO. Seven, so this is seven EDO. So 12 tone equal temperament is dividing an octave into 12. So we could call it 12 EDO. We can divide it into eight, seven, five. I've done other stuff in 72, which you have to use subsets of, but can be very nice. So we can just set it and put on Oh, the arpeggiators won't work here. Let's. So seven tone equal temperament is kind of like it's halfway between major and minor. It's not really out there, but it's definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Five tone equal temperament is actually really quite nice. It's pentatonic, but it's also kind of like an E 
interesting kind of pentatonic. And this is just cutting an octave into five equal pieces. Want something really spicy, we can go... What's the spiciest one I've got? Maybe here. A few of these are kind of just as a lark. Like, what if you divide the octave into ten and then make a maximally even subset of seven out of that? Just for the fun of it. Why not, why not see what happens? Yes. That one you heard a fair amount of in the pre-show. This is a Japanese pentatonic scale. Let me... It's easier with the piano. So here, Joshi is technically the name of one of the modes, and the other modes of it have different names, because we don't care what the root note is. It's kind of... What mode it sounds like is just depending on what it happens to be. Same reason we have diatonic rather than major and minor, because all those modes are just rotations of the same pitches. We've got Pelog, which is another uh, five note scale. This one is from Bali. It's almost a subset of 12 tone equal temperament, but one of the notes is bent a little bit off. to hear anything? I mean, I'm here till 9.30. <laughs> this, I just, I just turned on a, I just turned on two melody mutators and they were just doing their thing. Yeah. Uh, when everything, well, it depends what you set them to. Um, so, um, so this one's nice. We'll do. Oops, that's a little high. should say the main kind of dissemination of this is going to be some type of a stream, probably like a YouTube stream, but I'm going to set up a computer that I can just have 
for six hours on this day, it's going, and you can tune in while you're doing whatever and have fairly regular versions of it. It just it does its thing, and you can listen if you want to or, or whatever. Um, it's kind of odd coming and sitting in a room quietly listening to ambient music because it's sort of like, especially I'm sitting here and being like, is everybody interested enough? Is it doing enough things? Should I go and kick it and make it do something more? Whereas if it's just going when you're grading papers or something, you don't want it to change too much. I always get annoyed when I'm listening to ambient music while I'm doing something, and then the track changes, and it's like, it was only eight minutes. It needs to be longer than that. Put on some Brian Eno where it's the same thing for an hour. Music for a Thursday afternoon. Yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking chill ambient music to study by. Yeah. I, see, yeah, yeah. I could hit the meditation market if I talk about like tuning to align your chakras or something. Yeah. I could, I could do that. Yeah, that wouldn't be too hard to implement. No, but I, I know what you're talking about, and yeah, um, what, what I think of um, adaptive soundtracks, I think is what they're usually called. I would love to write music for a video game. I don't know any. I don't know anybody who's a game developer. If you know somebody who's making a game that needs cool music. Yeah, so, that usually has the best music. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't think I need it at this point. Yeah. 